The video I just put up about this pedal board got a lot bigger response than I anticipated. It's very gratifying. I'm a geek about such things. I love being deep in the weeds. And I generally get the sense that people on the channel want to know about how to fix their app, how to sound like a famous player, but they're not so interested in this kind of stuff. So it's gratifying to find out that I'm not the only lonely, pathetic soul out there who obsesses over stuff like this. I got a lot of questions about the interface box and how to make one and wire one. As for how to make one, it's a Hammond 1590B-BK. I'll put the part number from Mauser um, or Antique Electronics in the description. It's a very common part. It's a very inexpensive box. It's about 11 bucks, I think. Uh, it's Hammond 1590B, and the BK means it comes with this black uh, textured finish. Very common. Inside, you can see that I've got seven Amphenol jacks. These four here are mono, because I knew they'd only need to be mono. These two are stereo, and this one's stereo because I had it laying around. This is a Neutrik jack, which is similar in a lot of ways to the Amphenol. I had originally planned on using a Switchcraft jack there so that this would be the ground point for the guitar coming in. But as I mentioned, I discovered that would create a ground loop. So I had to uh, step back and put in another isolated, insulated jack so it wouldn't have that chassis connection, it would not be uh, any ground loop. And rather than order another Amphenol, I just bent over the, uh, the lugs on this Neutrik I already had. Uh, the reason I went with Amphenol for the others, and if I were to do this over again, I would use Amphenol for this one as well, is the Amphenol lugs don't come up as high. The uh, Neutrik and Cliff lugs come up a lot, and you cannot put the lid on with those lugs at least not where the uh, holes are located here, which is more or less centered vertically. So for this one, I bent the lugs over. For the others, the Amphenol lugs just don't stick up that much. So the signal comes in here, and it goes straight across to this jack and goes out to everything else. So I've got the sleeve going to the sleeve and the tip going to the tip, and I have this wire from the tip normal to the sleeve, which means that when nothing is plugged in, this is grounded out, so everything after that is connected to ground. It's a, a very easy way to get a, a quieter pedal board. That way, if nothing's plugged in, there's not a zzz at all times. Next, you can see here the DC plug going to this little Lundberg uh, DC jack, and there's one, another one here. It's just a feed through, hot to hot, ground to ground. It's not connected to anything else. It's just a way for me to have DC available on the outside for guest pedals, etc. Then I've got the stereo feed through. It's not being used at this point, but it could be in the future, and mono will work just fine with it. Anyway, I've got tip ring sleeve going to tip ring sleeve. That's all. And then I have the send and the return. And again, it's just sleeve to sleeve, tip to tip, tip to tip, sleeve to sleeve. The only tricky thing is here, the send, if nothing's plugged into this, the normal of the send tip is tied to the tip of the return. And the normal of the sleeve on the send is tied right here to the sleeve of the return. So when nothing's plugged into here, the signal comes in here and goes right back out. So it's like not being there at all. And these wires, you know, these cables are fairly short. You know, talking like the longest one is a foot maybe, maybe a little bit longer. Since I have that buffer in the tuner on the other side, these are pretty much all invisible. So as long as these contacts stay clean, and I'm not using this in, you know, in the mud or anything, this will be very nice and easy. And if, you know, 10 years from now, they start to wear out, they're about $2 each. I know, I know a guy. Anyway, that's all there is to it. That, you know, besides being careful when you make it, as for how to make one, uh, you can go to the Hammond website and get the uh, documents for this. You know exactly how high each side is. You know how long each side is and the top and all the dimensions. You just create that. I use a, uh, a program called Inkscape to do that. I used to use Illustrator until Adobe decided to be a bunch of jackasses. So no more Adobe from me. Before that, for decades, I happily used Corel Draw. Inkscape is free, but anyway, you just figure out, all right, these are the dimensions, and you plan everything out. In this case, I'm like, okay, that needs to be at least this wide, 
for the next one so that everything fits, nothing's jammed up against each other. And like this Amphenol jack, you could figure out from their website how wide it is. So you can say, okay, that needs to be at least, this needs to be at least 0.8 inches away from this. So let's make it 0.85. And you just play around with that spacing and see if you can get them all in there. In this case, I wanted to have one, two, three, four quarter inch jacks per side and then room for a little DC plug. So you just figure out the spacing. And once you do that, you print that out with little crosshairs or circles or whatever you wanna to do to show you where you're gonna make your drills. And then I take the, the paper that I printed out and I cut out the stuff I don't need and I use double-sided tape to attach it to the box. And at that point, I take a nail set and put right there on the center mark and tap it with a hammer and make a little indentation. Uh, if you're very, very careful at that point, you can do it by hand. I do prefer to use and highly recommend a drill press, but for something simple like this, you could do it by hand. You just need to use your nail set to make the center point punch of each one of these locations, a little divot in the metal. And then you use a small, sharp bit like this to start your center hole, because that's much easier to get going without wondering. It'll go right into the little divot you made with your nail set. Once I have those guide holes made, in this case, there's four per side, five per side, sorry, I forgot the DC. Then I go through and enlarge them with an eight inch bit, sorry, a one eighth inch bit, 0.125 inches. And once that's done, I know how large each hole needs to be, for instance, the DC is like, I think it's seven millimeters, might be nine millimeters, I don't remember. You just figure out, all right, well, this is, uh, can't read it, this thing's so worn, something 30 seconds, that's equivalent to the metric. So you use a step bit to enlarge that. And on these, it's seven sixteenths for all these jacks. Three eighths for a switchcraft, seven sixteenths for one of these. And you just set your drill to the right uh, speed and torque and you make sure you don't do it you know, on top of a nice rug. You're going to have aluminum shavings everywhere. Drill press in a workshop or outside is best. You can do this over a trash can. Lord knows I've done my share of that. The important thing is I'm not going in there with a very large drill bit, you know, like a huge honking one that's 7 sixteenths of an inch. It's almost half an inch because that would just wander and go like this and would tear the hell out of that you have really ragged holes. You've seen me do ragged, jagged hole repairs on chassis where people tried to use a, a drill bit. Always use a always use a stepped bit, and it'll follow your. It'll, if you're careful, it'll just follow the hole and not start to wander. Now with very large holes, like three quarter inch holes for a preamp tube, you cannot use this bit. You can sometimes use a much larger stepped bit. If the entire work is clamped to a bench and you have a very strong uh, uh, drill press, which is you know bolted down to a table and everything's tight, because if any one little thing goes wrong when you have that much metal, stuff starts to jitter and, and move around and you will just rip holes and things and things can go flying. For very large holes, it's better to use a, uh, a Greeley punch set, but that's beyond the scope of this. Anyway, this is how I made this little interface box. And I'll get those screws back on in just a minute. One other thing to point out before we end this video, and you'll get a chance to hear this uh, in a video dedicated just to that, as well as hopefully hearing it in lots and lots of amp videos, though I expect I'll be using this fairly subtly. A kind soul in the comment section, I don't remember your name, but I, I thank you, and I will put your name right here on the screen so you can get all the credit you deserve, pointed out that uh, True Tone is now recommending that you do use both uh, of these 500 milliamps, not just one uh, in a, a basically a current doubling setup to power the HX stomp. Uh, and it is running cooler since I made that change. So I thank you. And I did look that up. Yes, True Tone has changed their mind about the wisdom of powering the HX stomp off only one of these. Technically, it needs just under 900 milliamps. Um, and this supplies 500, but they said as long as the total draw does not exceed 1500 or 1600, you can use just one of these. They have since changed their mind, and since changing this, so I'm using both outlets. It is running cooler, which makes me feel better about uh, the, the future. This is not 
a, an expensive thing, but you know, it's a whole bunch of things which aren't expensive individually, and that adds up. And I don't like buying things twice. So you can see here, I used their ad uh, adapter. Actually, this is a uh, an adapter I already had from uh, Voodoo Labs, and it's going over here, and I've got it uh, zip tied down. I wish, uh, and I might just force these to to bend a little bit more, so they're not poking out. I don't like them po anything poking out. Um, I know I'll snag it with my foot or something stupid. Anyway, it is running cooler. So again, to the commenter whose name is on the screen, I appreciate you. I thank you very much. I always appreciate the comments, which are constructive. I learned so much from you guys. It's a great group of people overall. And I, I'm sorry if occasionally the trolls uh, make me a little bit uh, jaundiced. If you had as many people telling you you're an idiot a day as I do, you might be a little jaded and jaundiced yourself. But let's not bicker and argue over who killed who. This is supposed to be a happy occasion. I'll spare you my Monty Python accents. Anyway, thanks for watching.